This is Cheryl with the Estes Valley Library. Welcome to a special edition of Our Wonderful World. When the library closed in March, I knew we wouldn't be able to have Our Wonderful World the way we usually do. And so I contacted Kathy Delker, an Estes local, to ask her if she would like to speak on Uzbekistan, a trip she took in 2014. And she graciously agreed. This is four episodes that will be posted on Facebook and YouTube. Welcome, Kathy Delker. Hi, my name is Kathy Delker, and it's my pleasure to share with you photos that I took during my trip to Uzbekistan in 2014. I added Uzbekistan to my bucket list of places to visit in 1990 when I ran across a book in a bookstore entitled The Fabled Cities of, the Silk of Central Asia. Those cities are Bukhara, Hiva, and Samarkand. I had a wonderful trip which I booked through a travel company. The travel company had headquarters in New York, but was located in Turkey. The catalog for 2014 included this trip to Uzbekistan, and I thought, here's my opportunity. The rule was that if there were at least two people signed up, they would t the tour would be a go. Luckily for me, three of us signed up, we had our own guide and a van driver. So my photos will show you, first of all, the magnificent, monumentally, colorfully tiled buildings. That's what I wanted to see. And through the course of my 12 days on ground, of course, I saw lots of aspects of di daily life for the people who live in this Uzbekistan. I want to make sure that you know why Uzbekistan is so important, even though you may be like me and never heard of Timur, a world conqueror who rivaled Alexander the Great and Genghis Khan. And finally, I have some shots of activities that you might be interested in seeing sort of step by step. So there will be four episodes to this presentation. You'll be able to look at them on Facebook and YouTube from the library. You can look at all of them or watch them sequentially on different days or choose only to watch one of them. So we're going to transport ourselves into the almost magical world of monumental buildings and warm, friendly people. I'm Kathy Delker. Welcome to the next episode of my presentation on Uzbekistan. In this episode, I'm going to show you three demonstrations that I got to attend. And those of you who've traveled abroad, and it probably goes on in the US too, um, have encountered these presentations or demonstrations, uh, which help establish the value of treasures that you might want to purchased to bring home as mementos. The first is baking bread outdoors. Then we're going to go through, it's not quite a step-by-step -step, um, overview of manufacturing silk iCat fabric. And finally, handmade paper. So let's get going and I'm gonna make you hungry because doesn't that bread look just scrumptious. It's not really non bread. It is unleavened, but you can see it has enough uh, thickness that it's got texture to it. The amazing thing is that this bread is baked in 
a clay oven, and in this particular segment, um, the lady was making bread, you can see it on the table in the background, for restaurants to serve that evening. And in this photo, she's using a tool that has wires in a pretty shape to um, decorate, I'll call it, the round dough. So next, she slaps it on the side of the clay oven. We see her now reaching in to take a round of bread that is baked. And you'll see that she has this immense, I assume, asbestos glove and arm cover so that she doesn't get burned. And uh, the one thing about this open air oven is that she was able to monitor it and know exactly when to pull it out. Uh, a treat at some of the places where we stopped was to get bread right off the oven wall, and it won't surprise you to know that they monitored it carefully. My recollection is it took about 10 minutes. Now we've moved to that lunch that I told you about in daily living, where they served my two tour group companions, our van driver and the tour guide outdoors in a courtyard next to a home in the country. Uh, this is one of the women, village women, that the hostess employed. And she, I think, is putting water on the back of the dough to make it cling a little more to the wall. This particular round of bread doesn't really have any decoration on it, but you can see uh, the coals. Uh, my understanding is that they would not be using the flame when the bread is actually baking. They would have uh, burned the fuel and created the coals. And you can see it's quite a range of stuff and the shield to keep the heat. Uh, I never have figured out how our ancestors cooked, especially baked, over a wood fire. And now she is watching to see what's happening. The bread from Uzbekistan varies by region. And here is some bread being sold at the market in Tashkent. And you can see it looks a lot different. The legend is that Timur, the 14th century ruler and military strategist, had a favorite type of bread. And so someone from that region traveled with the army. Now we're going to um, a tourist area, a pleasure area in Bukhara, and the guy on the bicycle is selling bread that's not quite as thick as that in the previous slide. And we get one more slide. I think this is again from Tashkent, the big market with the flatter bread. The bread is just scrumptious. Now I'd like to take you through some of the basic steps for creating the silk eye cat fabric. The cocoons from the silk worm made their way from China to Uzbeka centuries and centuries ago. And it turns out mulberry trees like it in Uzbekistan, and so the silkworms are happy there. After they spin their cocoon, they are taken from the farm to a facility where they're boiled. The first step is to boil them. You can see the steam rising in the lower left corner, and the lady is 
pulling the strands of silk fiber off each well, in this case, it looks like maybe it's six cocoons simultaneously. Undoubtedly, there's a fair amount of uh, skill involved in this step. Then it goes to the woman to spin the fibers into thread. And from there, it goes to the machine that enables them to put in a skein. So those are the first steps of dealing with the silk from the cocoon. Now that the silk is in skeins, it goes to another area where the craftsmen have put it on a horizontal loom, and this shows that they use a pattern in this piece, another fab piece of ICAT fabric. And I know you can't see, but they used something, uh, maybe even pencil, to draw the design. Once they've drawn it, men, and it's my understanding this step is only done by the men, section it off and everywhere that they don't want the first dye to touch the skilk, they wrap resistant thread around the bunches, however broad the design is at that point, wrap this resistant material around the silk so that that area will not take up the dye. The dyeing process looks pretty primitive to me. Um, different vats, different colors, and of course, in Uzbekistan, they were using plant-based dyes, not Ritz dyes. When the fabric comes out of a vat, you can see this one was in the yellow color, and a close-up allows you to see that nowadays, they're probably using some kind of synthetic fiber. It looks very shiny to me, but that those white areas didn't get yellow. So eventually, they've got the whole design dyed, and it goes then to the weaving loom. The design is on the lengthwise threads, and then the shuttle will send the other thread from side to side. Here is a picture of a woman sitting at the loom, and you can see her feet do things, and uh, her hands are doing things. Uh, I know we've got weavers here in the Estes area, so this may look pretty familiar to you. Uh, this is a workshop, and so there must have been 10 or 12 of these looms in one long room with the um, concrete floor. And the whole purpose at this facility, uh, in addition to showing tourists how uh, the fabric is made, and I think you'll agree it's a labor-intensive process, and I did a little reading in creating the ICAT patterns this way takes a lot of skill. But then they want to sell it to you, and so the facility had its own retail area. The jacket on the right and also on the left definitely look like iCat weaving to us, and several of the pieces that are on the frame at the back of the room are iCat. Now let's look at some iCat fabric that's displayed in museums. I think you'll agree, these are pretty far out designs considering they may be more than centuries old. Uh, another pair of, of fabric samples. When I was in Uzbekistan, iCat fabrics were showing up in American design magazines for using to cover pillows and as upholstery. 
Uh, here's another one, and finally, uh, the really showy piece of fabric that actually is made into what I will call a caftan. Icat fabric is still being made, and our guide loved to model. Every day she was with us, she had on a different outfit made of iCat fabric. It's also made as a silk cotton combination and probably cotton only. Um, I suspect the fabric she wore um, was indeed done using the techniques that are centuries old. Uh, she and her husband uh, had a higher income than many people in Uzbekistan, uh, of course, in the U.S. and maybe in Uzbekistan, too, it's easy to imagine how they would have printed that fabric. So that's your introduction to making silk fabric out of the cocoon silk threads and filaments, actually, and then um, dyeing it and weaving it. I'd like to tell you now about the handmade paper in, in Uzbekistan. And I say handmade, and that's not quite true because they use tools. This technique dates back to the 14th century, if not earlier. And it's said that uh, Timur, the uh, ruler and military strategist, uh, really liked the mulberry tree paper. So here we are at a very small demonstration facility out in the country, or at least in an area that was pretty rural. And you see the woman who's been given branches from the mulberry tree. Um, the bark is taken off, and then she strips off the living wood, and um, there's a tube that she's wrapping it around. Um, I'm not quite sure why some of it ends up on our left-hand side in a tub. Talk about labor-intensive. This batch of strips from the branches of the mulberry tree then is boiled I'm not quite sure how long they boil it, but it is boiled to the point of mushiness. Then it goes into a sort of mechanized beating station, and the four diagonal wood timbers are attached to a gear system run by a water wheel. And it's set up so that they pound the um, mushy mulberry tree fibers. In the next picture, you will see how um, some of the timbers go down and some of them go up depending on what the water wheel is doing. And I spent a little time trying to figure out how this water wheel worked. Uh, we've got water coming in from the left into that trough. And the water wheel in dead center is a can, just a tin can. And as the water wheel goes round, the water off the flanges goes into the tin can, which weights it, and it goes around. Inside the house, when the timber goes down, it beats the mushy fiber. And you can see there is a stir. The young man is mixing up the fiber as those timbers pound into the mushy fiber. After this step, they put the fiber into a tub, and the tub has more water 
in it. Oops, I'm ahead of myself uh, here. We're still pending, but now we're in the vat, I guess I should call it, with the fiber mixed with lots of water, and the guy um, is taking a frame with very fine mesh on it, dipping it in and pulling it out with the fiber on the mesh. After it's on the mesh, he stacks several of these frames, puts the wood over them, and weights it down to flatten it out, and it dries partially. Next step is to remove the paper from the frame. It's not completely dry, so it's hung up to dry. And then they polish it by hand. So here um, they're showing us uh, on the right, the guy has a seashell in his hand. Then there's a horn on the paper, and the guy is holding a rock. So uh, the different polishing tool gives a little different texture. Here are uh, close-ups of the three tools. Finally, the paper is ready to sell. The paper has two big advantages. It's very sturdy, not like our photocopy paper by any means, um, and of course somewhat textured. And the big advantage with the people centuries ago um, really appreciating is it's insect resistant. So here is a photo of some of the things that they were selling at this demonstration facility, um, individual sheets of paper, they had the gift bags made up, and you see that the paper is actually sturdy enough that they made a shirt. It's sturdy enough that it's embroidered. They also had greeting cards. Um, so this was a fun look at paper from scratch in a centuries-old method. I have some further reading that you might be interested in. And if you want to contact me, send me an email at kathyinestespark at gmail.com.